Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is Michael Mann, Dr. Michael Mann. Thank you for being here. Great to be with you. I'm going to read your bio. Um, I do know quite a bit of it, but I wrote it down because I think this is important, um, and so I want to read it if I can see my own uh, <laughs> cards here. So Dr. Michael Mann, Dr. Mann, he is a distinguished, or he is the Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State and director of the Penn State Earth Science System. I'm sorry, of the Penn State Earth System Science Center. It's a tongue twister, yeah. <laughs> he has a PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale University, and his research focuses on climate science and climate change. He was selected by Scientific American as one of the 50 leading visionaries in science and technology. He received the National Conservation Achievement Award for science by the National Wildlife Federation. He made Bloomberg News' list of 50 most influential people in 2013. In 2014, he received the Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science Education. Just this year, he received the Stephen H. Snyder Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the, Admi for the Advancement of Science. He is co-founder of the award-winning science website realclimate.org, has authored more than 200 publications and several books, such as Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change, The Hockey Stick and Climate Wars, and The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. This part, I, you can correct me on, but you've testified before Congress or just generally? Sure. sure. Yeah. Testified before Congress several times? Um, and unfortunately, you've been threatened several times, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and have attempted punitive action against you by legislators in your own state. Yeah. Um, so you know what you're talking about. And the reason I read this, it may seem like a lot to read, but as I was thinking about speaking with you, it became more of a matter of authority for me. You know what you're talking about, right? You've studied this for years. I don't, is there anything else you want to add to your bio? But you know what you're talking about. I'd like to think so, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think I'm going to, can you briefly synopsize this? I know this is a huge question. But many, I, my, my, I myself, I'm innumerate. So if you tell me the national debt is trillions, <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything to me. It's too big a number. Um, even into the millions, I'm not quite certain of things. And I hope you can sympathize with that. You're a scientist. You work with the climate. You study it. It's a huge, um, it's a huge issue. And so when I first heard about this years ago, it just struck me as how could the human population have any effect on a system so big? Because I'm thinking it's like the universe. I've come around based on authority and evidence because I, I don't have the expertise to look into every detail of what's going on. No one does, really, except for you people you people being scientists and climate scientists. So can you, I don't know, synopsize, if it's possible, the evidence, the overwhelming evidence? Do you understand my question? Yeah, sure. Um, it, first of all, it's, there is this sense that the Earth is so large, our atmosphere seems so large, it's hard to believe that we can have an impact um, on it. And yet, we have now raised the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to levels that the Earth hasn't seen in billions of years, in, sorry, in, in millions of years. Um, so we have the ability to... And we? We human beings, uh, through fossil fuel burning, through other human activities, have the ability to raise the concentration of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, over a period of only a hundred years. Um, that would take literally millions of years for nature to do. So it's the way that we have accelerated the, the processes. Um, what we're doing is we're literally taking the carbon that natural processes buried beneath the surface of the earth over a hundred million years and we're now putting it back into the atmosphere. Um, we're now taking these fossil fuels, um, we're, we're mining them, we're using them, burning the carbon, putting the CO2 back into the atmosphere on a time scale that's a million times faster than the time scale on which nature uh, buried that Can carbon I dioxide. interrupt you? If, do you mind? Please. Because we are having a conversation, I generally interrupt. I, it's not because I'm trying to be rude, but I need clarification. Yeah. But I think it's starting to make even more sense to me. So what you're, if I may, um, it would, by nature it would take a very long time. If we dig into it and expose it, 
quicker, it's just quicker. So it's not unlike if I have a glass of, maybe this is a terrible analogy, but if I have a glass of wine with dinner, one thing. If I drink two bottles in an hour, it's another thing. Is no, that's right. Um, you know, we and other living things can adapt to changes in climate driven by changes in the concentrations of greenhouse gases that happen over 100 million years. Nature can adapt to changes because that happen slow. that slow. Because it's slow, exactly. Uh, but there is no evidence that we or other living things can adapt to changes of that magnitude that occur over a time scale of only 100 years. So that's really the threat. It isn't that the Earth has never been warmer than it is today. There are periods when it's been warmer. It's the fact that we're warming the planet and changing our climate um, at a rate that has no precedent, um, even going back into geological time. Uh, also, to get a sense of why it is that we can modify um, our climate uh, by burning fossil fuels and, and putting CO2 into the atmosphere, um, if you look at Earth's atmosphere from space, um, and you know, in the 1960s we first got images um, uh, from the moon, from space, looking back at the Earth, um, and it gave us an appreciation of how our atmosphere is just this very thin shell. If you take a globe, um, a, a standard size globe, and you paint a very thin layer of, uh, uh, of paint on top of the globe, um, our atmosphere is the thickness of that paint. Um, so it's actually very fragile, very thin, and very fragile. Some people say, well, you know, CO2 concentrations of, you know, a few hundred parts per billion, that seems too small to, yeah. to, to make a difference. Well, you know, arsenic and cyanide are, fader, uh, are fatal in concentrations lower than that, lower than the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere. So we know that a potent substance, even in, in those concentrations, can have a, a profound impact. Uh, in the absence of a natural greenhouse effect, Earth would be a frozen planet. Um, the, the natural greenhouse effect raises Earth's temperature by about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. What we're doing now is we're raising the temperature above Did the level. Did you say 60? about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer, 33 degrees Celsius, we would be, um, we would have a temperature of minus 18 degrees Celsius. That would be the average temperature of the Earth rather than the actual temperature okay. of about 16 degrees Under Celsius. Under those conditions, okay. Yeah, in the absence of a greenhouse effect. So the natural greenhouse effect is a good thing, but like so many good things, uh, too much, you know, in moderation, they're, they're helpful, but too much of a good thing is problematic. And what we're doing now is we're increasing that greenhouse effect. Um, do you understand why it's difficult for people like myself to understand that? Well, you know... Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah. I accept it, yeah. but it's so it's such a massive thing to undertake to study from your end and then try and explain it back to me. It, it is hard to imagine the numbers. Um, you know, our carbon, another thing is um, when we burn fossil fuels, they're invisible. You know, when, when we uh, drive our car, when we use power, um, power that's being generated from a power station that might be using burning coal to generate that power, um, it's sort of invisible to us. And yet if you look at how much carbon we're putting into the atmosphere um, every year, it's uh, about um, 60 gigatons of carbon dioxide. A gigaton is a billion tons. So it's 60 billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. It's really hard to, to wrap your yeah, mind that, around those numbers. That's a meaningless numbers. number to me. So this is what I try to do. I try to um, uh, take that, a gigaton, a billion tons of CO2. Okay, that, before you do yeah. a gigaton, you mean literally by weight, if I got all those particles into a wheelbarrow, that's right. And so it's literally weight. It's not some kind of like volume or you, you can measure it by volume or, or weight, but, but the mass literally weight. The, the, the mass. mass of so the analogy, it's not even an analogy, it's just a translation. That a gigaton um, is the mass of an ice cube that is one kilometer on its side. One kilometer stretching. If we were to look out the the window, um, out a kilometer, a, a cube with that dimension. And that's every year. And so we're putting 60 of those 60. one kilometer sized ice cubes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Well, every you year. can easily understand that if we saw 60 of those <laughs> floating around every year, we'd say, what the hell? No, we would right. know there's a problem. That's right. It's hard to visualize. It's hard to, I mean, we as you know, human beings, and we're here at a conference about skepticism. Um, and uh, one of the challenges um, uh, is that our experiences, um, our evolutionary history and our experiences make it very difficult to appreciate and understand 
um, impacts at that scale, at the scale of the entire globe. It's just so hard for us to get our heads around. Um, that's why we have science. Science is intended to, uh, to be uh, a guide, uh, to be you know, a candle in the dark, as Carl Sagan described it, um, to illuminate the way uh, you know, the, the physical world is and the way it works um, because it isn't intuitive. It often isn't intuitive. We need, we need tools to be able to understand, to investigate science, to understand it, and to translate it. Before we get into some more specific questions, what you've said raised another one. Is there anything else you want to say? But let me, before Let's that... Let's just go wherever okay. you want to go here. <laughs> so how long, not you personally have known it's a problem, because you're not that old, I assume, but when did someone's, when did this start to become an issue in the sciences and say, I mean... It doesn't make any sense to me that even somebody would start investigating this without cause. So what was, why would someone say, wait, there's a problem here, and one person starts it, it, it and it grows? Yeah, so there's this notion um, out there that somehow the science of climate change, that this is some new science, that this is something that's very recent, um, that it's a very uh, immature area of science, and, and that simply isn't true. Uh, Joseph Fourier was a scientist who lived in the early 1800s. Uh, he gave us the law of heat conduction, the way that heat moves, uh, diffuses through objects. He's the one who, who provided a physical law for that. Um, he also, in mathematics, if you study mathematics, you come across Fourier's theorem uh, or the Fourier transform. He was one of these uh, polymaths back in the early oh. 1800s when there were just so many wide open problems that you could be doing cutting edge uh, scientific research in chemistry and physics and, and, and astronomy. Um, it was sort of back in, in the day, as it were. Uh, and Fourier understood that there was a greenhouse effect in the early 1800s. Um, so I'll sometimes needle my friends who are in evolutionary biology and, and they also face um, sort of uh, contrarianism um, when it comes to the theory of evolution. Uh, I'll needle them that our science actually goes back further than their science. It goes back further than uh, Darwin uh, to the early 1800s. We knew that there was a greenhouse effect. And over the last two centuries, what we've been doing is refining our understanding of how the greenhouse effect works and what the implications are of the greenhouse effect when it comes to the burning of fossil fuels and how we're increasing it. So you, it's been monitored, so to speak? We have been, well, For we've two been, centuries. Yeah, we, the basic science we've understood for nearly two centuries. Um, the first uh, estimates of how much warming we, we could see from the burning of fossil fuels resulting from the Industrial Revolution um, in the early 1900s. Um, there were credible estimates. Arrhenius, who also, the Arrhenius definition of an acid, he, again, one of those scientists who worked in all these different areas. He made fundamental contributions in chemistry, but he also made fundamental contributions to the, the science of, of climate. Um, uh, actually doing some back of the, there were no supercomputers back in the early 1900s, um, but uh, he was able to do some back of the envelope calculations that it turns out were pretty darn close to the best estimates we have today no from kidding. models run on supercomputers. Wow. Yeah. And, and what he found was that the, if we double the concentration of greenhouse gases, relative to pre-industrial levels, uh, that we would see warming somewhere in the range of three, four, five degrees Celsius, um, you know, uh, five, six, seven, eight degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that is more or less the range of estimates we have today. Well, that's what, what the question that was following was, when did you decide to become a climate scientist? Is that an appropriate term, climate scientist? Can I yeah, shorten sure. it up to that? Absolutely. Yep. Um, because I kind of was under the assumption that you probably went to school for something else and then you changed over. But if what you're saying is it's been a science for so long, someone could actually have gone into it 40 years ago. Not that that's when you started, but did you yeah. start off as a climate scientist or were you just interested in physics and you chose this path? Or how yeah, that it's the latter. So both of the things you said are true. The, the, sci the basic science of climate change has been around for some time. Now the interest in the science of climate change certainly took off in the 1970s, 1980s, and especially in the 1990s as the evidence emerged that you know, the climate was indeed warming and changing. Um, that garnered a lot of interest among scientists. I was part of the exodus from um, theoretical physics of oh, the late 1980s. Yeah, I started out, um, I went to UC Berkeley, double majored in applied math and physics, went on to Yale University to study uh, physics, uh, theoretical physics. Um, this was in the late 1980s. 
And it was actually a tough time in physics because uh, the, um, there were high expectations because of the construction of the superconducting super collider in Texas was going to really provide a lot of funding for, for, for physics research, experimental as well as, as sort of spin-off theoretical of, uh, physics funding. Um, and then that project was canceled. And so there was sort of this pretty loud sucking sound of, uh, of people who were planning on going into physics, finding that some of the opportunities were drying up um, and looking to other fields. Where, where could we take physics and math, the skills that we had uh, learned, um, the tools that we had at our disposal, and apply them to interesting problems in other areas? And, and literally at Yale University, just down the hill from the physics building, was the Klein Geology Tower uh, where there were uh, professors, um, there were faculty members who were using math and physics to model Earth's climate system. And I went and talked with one of them, his name's Barry Saltzman, um, and uh, ultimately decided to go ahead and do my PhD um, in, in that department uh, using math and physics to model Earth's climate system, this really interesting, wide open physics. And it is a physics problem at some level. It's a fluid dynamics problem. You've got the, the o ocean, the atmosphere, are these two fluids that uh, interact with each other. They're being heated externally by the sun. Um, the, the chemistry of the atmosphere has an influence on the energy distribution within the system. There are ice sheets, and you have to physically model their behavior. So you couldn't ask for a bigger physics problem to tackle. And I simplify it when I say it's a physics problem because it's also a biology problem. Um, the the, ocean car the uh, global carbon cycle um, relies on, you know, the, the, the life on Earth participates in the distribution of carbon in the ocean and the atmosphere, and chemically that influences the radiative properties of the atmosphere. So it's, it's a physics problem, but with chemistry and biology, and of course because climate change has become a sort of a societal problem as well, there are now all these other dimensions, uh, yeah. economics and, and politics and everything else you can imagine. What you just said leads perfectly into my pre-formatted questions, and I apologize <laughs> for pre-formatted, but I did think of some. And great, um, you may unintentionally have given fodder right now to some—I don't know if you want to call them skeptics or denialists—that would say it's all about funding. You want to get funding, so you're studying because you said you, there was this large project you were interested in. The project got canceled, so you had to switch over. Right. So we go, oh, well, it's all about the funding. Then the money was gone, so you had to move on. So one of my first questions was healthy skepticism versus yeah. an un unwillingness to yep. accept the facts. So I don't know what you think about what I just said there. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, scientists are, are human beings. They want to do what they want to do. I went into science because I love working on interesting problems, but you've got to pay the bills. Right. <laughs> so, so there's no question that scientists are more or less forced to go into fields where, where there is funding, but keep in mind that what that funding does, it, it funds your research. Um, it, you know, if you're a university pro professor like me, um, your salary is determined by your institution. So the funding supports your research program. It supports your graduate students. It allows you to publish articles, to pay the, the, the page charges of articles. It allows you to come to meetings, like this one here in Las Vegas, um, to talk about your science and interact with other scientists. So there's no question. Um, you know, we need funding to do all those things. But it doesn't go to our pockets. Our salaries are determined by our institution. Uh, in this case, Penn State. I'm a professor at Penn State, and I have a salary for teaching. Um, you know, and, and all the other things I do as a university professor. So there is this mythology, and it's in part, it has been, it's a myth that has certainly been promoted by those looking to discredit the science of climate change. You know, oh, these scientists are just going into it for the money, these millions of dollars of grant money. Um, it sounds very compelling to a public that doesn't understand how things actually work in science. The, the funding doesn't go to your pocket. Yeah, you don't get the millions, but a lot of it's in labs and equipment too, it's right? It's labs and equipment. If you're a lab scientist, absolutely. Um, and it's in funding students and postdocs and your research program. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but I want to throw something out there. It's also possible that if a, uh, not, a, not, a not a scientist specifically, but if a professor or a research, uh, a research person at a university 
is accepting funding inappropriately to come up with specific results, that's investigated and they lose their job, right? So that's this- That's absolutely right, yeah. That's a no-no, uh, you know. So you, the, the implication, <laughs> yeah. it's a double-edged insult in a way to say that you're only doing it for the money, but then also that you're, you're literally only doing, you're, you're, um, you're corrupt in a way. You're coming up with, with results that someone else wants to see, which has happened in science before, but those people, uh, oh, they yeah. get the boot. You no, know, that's right, and, and the irony here, and, and there's often irony in the attacks that are, you know, the sort of forces of anti-science and, and pseudoscience um, have these tools that they use to try to attack uh, science and undermine uh, the public faith in science, and often, the, um, their talking points and the accusations that they make against scientists are oddly sort of, um, uh, they're an example of what we sometimes call a reflection or a, um, a mirror. Projection? Projection, projection. So basically that person is getting paid to attack you, is that what you're saying? <laughs> exactly, yeah, so the, a lot of the, 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 um, the scientists, you know, who serve as um, sort of mouthpieces for the fossil fuel industry attacking the science of climate change. Uh, many of them literally are getting paid money that does go to their pockets for being advocates uh, for various, you know, uh, groups, um, uh, front groups, um, fossil fuel uh, funded outlets. Um, and that's their job though, is and to be the their, They are paid advocates. And, and unfortunately, you know, the history of science, ha you know, shows that this is something that often happens, that when there's an area of science um, where the findings of science potentially collide with the interests of powerful um, vested interests, uh, then sometimes those vested interests have sort of decided to use their power um, and their vast uh, resources um, to wage a public relations campaign against the scientific community. And often they will buy, buy off um, a, a few prominent scientists with impressive credentials um, who are willing to, to use those credentials to bolster their broadsides, their attacks against their fellow scientists. Can I ask a question about that? If someone takes a job like that, do they have to resign from their university or do they get retired people? Because it seems like you would get some backlash from your scientific community of cohorts saying, or is that, that's not right the word, uh, colleagues that saying, hey, you can't work here at the university and, and deal with the truth, but then take a million dollars to go out and spout nonsense. Yeah, and you know, there are ethical guidelines. Um, so with universities... Um, I'm and, sorry, we're way off track, but no, no maybe it's not, a very interesting uh, uh, topic of uh, discussion. And, um, and in academia, you have sort of these two competing principles. Academic freedom is academics should be free to go wherever, you know, their findings, their ideas take them, their work takes them um, without fear of repercussion. Um, and, and, and I believe that in that principle, it's a very important principle in academia. Um, and it, and, and it, what it allows is um, for academics to pursue things that might be unpopular or that might be speaking truth to power and might be a threat to powerful vested interests. Academic freedom is this, 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 this principle that preserves the independence of academics to boldly go wherever you know, their work takes them. And it's really important to defend that. At the same time, there have to be ethical guidelines as well. Um, if there is a clear violation of basic ethical principles, well, you can't just say that that is protected by academic freedom. There have to be some rules as to what's going too far. And if you are, for example, um, secretly taking money from you know, special interests and producing work that is not a reflection of your honest scientific inquiry, but is really just an act of advocacy on the part of that vested interest that is paying you. Um, that's a no-no, uh, particularly if you haven't disclosed it. And so there are, in most institutions, certainly at Penn State where I uh, teach, there are uh, pretty strict uh, disclosure requirements. Is it per university? It's not a 
Well, yeah, I mean, but it's really... But they probably all are similar. Yeah, most universities have pretty strict ethical guidelines and disclosure um, requirements. If you're taking uh, funding, um, if you're doing consulting, um, you have to file all of that information. And at Penn State, for example, uh, every year um, I have to disclose any sources of funding that I've received. Um, and there is a division within the university that scours through that stuff to make sure that there oh. isn't a conflict of interest. Um, the other side doesn't have to deal with that. So we, have, we are bound to act uh, ethically, and we have rules that enforce that, and I think that's a good thing. Until you retire. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and then and, you, can, you, you can become a mouthpiece for your... Well, and that's often what happens. And, and I'm not sure it's entirely just for the financial reasons. Um, what you sometimes find... You know, uh, professors who, we, we have an expression, have gone emeritus, <laughs> which is like, you know, in the latter stages of your career, after you, you've retired, there's sometimes a tendency for them to sort of veer off in, 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 a, in, in a new direction and sometimes in, 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 in a way that um, does uh, sort of reflect almost antipathy towards their fellow um, academic, you, you sometimes see um, you know, professors at the end of their career who will take a position paid for by the tobacco industry. Um, there's a very famous uh, case of uh, scientist Frederick Seitz, who was the chair of the National Academy of Sciences. I mean, as high up as you can go um, in science, a very respected uh, solid state physicist. Um, in fact, worked in the same area of physics that I started out in. Um, and then when he uh, retired, uh, he took a position um, on the part of R.J.R. Reynolds Tobacco. Um, and they gave him, I believe, $100 million a year to found um, an institute called the George Marshall Institute, whose sole purpose was to debunk the science linking tobacco to human health. Um, that's pretty clearly unethical. Um, the most brilliant scientists, people sometimes ask, well, how can that be? These are brilliant scientists. How could they go off and act so unethically? Unfortunately, you know, brilliance and, 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 and sort of mor morality are not necessarily, um, you know, don't always uh, come side by side. Uh, and there are brilliant scientists who have been bought off by special interests who have become mouthpieces for those special interests, whether it's the tobacco industry or the chemical industry or the pharmaceutical industry or the fossil fuel industry. Yeah, I can also maybe, I don't know if this would be part of it at all, but I can also see spending 30 to 40 years in academia and not being recognized to what you think is your due. I hate to make it a ego thing, Oh, oh, I may have touched something. No, there's absolutely something there. Just based on my own perceptions of knowing scientists who have sort of become contrarians, uh, and, and, and sometimes that's how it starts out. They start to become sort of devil's advocates, contrarians, stubborn and, and, and just sort of a bit uh, um, difficult, right? Um, and, and that, and I think that sometimes arises understandably, um, you know, as you move on in your career, you've got younger scientists who are getting a lot of attention and are, are getting a lot of acclaim. Oh, um, okay. And you're sort of falling, in, unless you're working really hard to stay up, um, you know, on top of things, it's sort of difficult. As you go on uh, in academia and scientific research, um, you, you tend to be less hands-on. You're advising groups of students and postdocs. You're sort of doing less of that down-in-the-trenches science yourself. You're falling behind in terms of uh, learning the, the latest programming languages or the latest tools and techniques that scientists use. And so there is this feeling that sometimes arises of irrelevancy and, and, res and resentment. Um, and this is one way to get, and, and you're no longer in the limelight, you're no longer in the spotlight. One way to get that spotlight is to be in that handful of, you know, respected scientists who is willing to sort of go against the prevailing uh, view of the scientific community. There's a real niche there, um, and that niche is often occupied by some of these folks. Well, let's talk, we'll talk brief and now that you said handful, I'll bring up two things. One is uh, I was a teaching assistant. No, wait. Yeah, in graduate school, I was yeah. a teaching assistant. So um, it's difficult for me to figure out how a, 
a working research professor would have time to have a side job taking money illicitly and influences research. But the other thing is, I know this is going to sound like a terrible thing to say, but you, as a teacher myself and as a teaching assistant, um, you want your students to do well right. and you want them really to be better than you, yeah. but you don't want them to be better than you. It's like this weird... <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, scientists because are Because then they take over the, okay, go, sorry. Yeah, no, I think you put your finger, scientists are, hum we're human beings, you know, we, um, we scientists suffer from the same uh, foibles that all human beings suffer from, vanity, narcissism, um, uh, you know, all those things that afflict ordinary people can afflict scientists as well. Um, and it's important to remember that. And, and, I, and I think that scientists can feel those same conflicts that we all think of wanting, you know, on the one hand, wanting the younger generation to do as well as they can. And as a teacher, you know, every year I get this fresh crop of first year students and I'm- and, They're and ready just, to go. Yeah, and it's so exciting, it's so refreshing for me, it's so invigorating because they're full of energy and, you know, the world is theirs, you know, is at their disposal and, uh, and they're just sort of beginning to, um, you know, to, to, ta to, 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 to uh, you know, they're just beginning on this great journey. Um, of uh, exploration and learning and um, and you want to see them do well and you want to see your students do well and you want to see your graduate students and your postdocs go on to do well but ultimately at some point there are finite resources right um, and there's a finite amount of science funding and eventually you will find yourself competing with your own postdocs yeah. or your own graduate students for that funding or for you know that precious amount of space that there is in the leading journals, you, you know, nature and science and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there's a lot of competition to publish in the, in the, in the premier journals. And, there's, and so you're, 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 you find yourself eventually competing with them. And as long as the rules are the rules of, of you know, honest engagement, um, you know, that process works fine. Um, it's when scientists become possessive uh, of uh, pet theory or they become defensive um, that they sometimes engage in behavior that is sort of antithetical to the way we like to think of science working. You know, there is a tussle. There is a give and take in science. It is, it can be combative, but as long as that combat, you know, is sort of um, obeys certain rules of honesty um, and, 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 and honest disclosure um, and good faith, um, then that's okay. I mean, you know, that is what Carl Sagan, you know, called the, the self-correcting machinery of science and it's skepticism, real skepticism, challenging your fellow scientists, peer review process. Um, this is all, in, in a sense, it's, it's intrinsically a competitive system, but that competitive system does, you know, help guide science toward the path of, you know, objective truth. And I, I don't want to make this too big a deal because, um, because it seems like I just did, but there, the scientific community is also very generous with their praise. I don't know if you've read much Richard Dawkins' work, but he is very generous with this person helped me understand this when I was young, and then I had a student that brought it this much more, and people that I meet here will say, you really need to talk to this person. So it's, it's not... This isn't the norm. I mean, people are very generous with sharing. If you're at the top, you're not hesitant to say, you know, I didn't get here myself. And yeah, I think I think the best scientists are very much that way. Not all scientists well, share not, that of outlook. Of course not. But 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 most of the best scientists do, and they recognize that you know those of us who succeed in science stood on the shoulders of giants. That that's how we got to where we were. And sometimes um, a student brings something to you. you well, I'm not saying it happened to you specifically, but sometimes a student will <laughs> bring something and say, "Hey, look at what I'm thinking here. What do you think of this?" And you'll go, "It would be profoundly disappointing if we didn't learn." from the work of our students and, and our postdocs, and we didn't change our minds sometimes based on the work of the younger generation of scientists. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's all good. All right, and I'll sum up um, this part where I was a 
mu I have a graduate degree in music and undergraduate music. And it's interesting because I remember one of my professors saying, my students take my gigs from me, right? Because they get to the <laughs> right. level and they, you start right. losing money that way. I mean, way. there, it's almost, uh, the competition oh, sure, is even direct. more direct, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that's interesting to see how this works throughout the world, I guess. All right, so. Well, you know, there's commonality between music and science and math. There, there are intersecting uh, what, attributes there, yeah. Um, all right, so. I, I, I play the piano. I, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, all right. For a hobby. Well, For a hobby, yeah. I, well, I play by ear. So, like, you oh. can give me a song, and, and, and there's a good chance I can play it. That, no that's kidding. what I do. That's yeah. a great skill. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fun. It's, it's fun at parties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, let me get to my first question here healthy skepticism versus an unwillingness to accept the facts. So, what's the difference between a healthy skepticism and just denial? I'm sorry to use denial. But it's well, I think denial, when you're denying basic science, let's call, okay. call it what it is. So what's healthy um, skepticism? What's an unwillingness to look at the facts? So I think healthy skepticism, you know, I think I would say, and I think most, you know, I think most of our fellow skeptics at this conference would say healthy skepticism, to use a physical term, is isotropic. It's in all directions. Yep. It's all around. It's in every direction, which means it's focused back on you, too. You hold your own views to the same scrutiny that you would hold others' uh, views to. And, um, and so there's self-reflection and there's some internalization of that skepticism. And when you look at sort of climate change denialism, what you find is um, a tendency to challenge the consensus science based on the flimsiest of arguments that just don't hold up to the slightest bit of scrutiny. So these contrarians, these, you know, they're not skeptics, uh, they're contrarians or, or deniers of science, are applying skepticism in only one direction. They're not subjecting their own arguments to any degree of self-scrutiny. And so what you'll often find is, you know, that um, climate change contrarians will attack the science of climate change based on a series of arguments that have been debunked time and time again. Um, and yet, they're like, you know, we sometimes call these zombie arguments. It doesn't matter how many times they've been debunked, they just keep on coming back. Um, and in part, they keep on coming back because there's always a fresh audience uh, right. of people to mislead and confuse, unfortunately, if, if you're a climate change denier. And even though some audiences may or will be aware that the, the argument has been debunked, as long as they're still victims <laughs> um, to be misled, unfortunately, those, those arguments continue to be recycled. Um, you know, even today, you hear the claim that global warming has stopped. That's one of the favorite talking points of climate change deniers, that global warming has stopped. We just had three consecutive record years in a row, 2014, 2015, 2016, each broke the record for the warmest year on record. By no possible argument, there's no possible argument that you could uh, employ to support the contention that global warming has in any sense stopped. Um, but we continue to hear that claim. Yeah. And part of what you said is it's denying basic science. Right. And, and earlier you spoke about the handful. So let's go to back to that. So what, what does consensus mean? So People often say, well, nobody, uh, it's, not a, it's not a consensus because it's not 100%. So you have a handful of scientists or um, contrarians. So I'm sure, I don't know if this is true or not, but I imagine it's news stations like CNN, NBC, MSNBC, they have a Rolodex of people. If they want to get a different opinion, they can scan right. through. So w what do you mean denying basic science and consensus and a handful? Yeah, so you know, it's important to distinguish between there are areas of science that are genuinely contentious where they're, and, and, and they're at the sort of forefront of our knowledge um, where there still are uncertainties and, they're, uh, sci and, and we're still working to understand um, the science and there are scientists who have, uh, who hold very different views um, each of which are honestly held. Um, there's, there's room for honest differences of viewpoint um, because there's, there, there's, there's true uncertainty. And among those areas, I would list um, the precise impact that climate change is going to have on hurricane activity uh, or tornadoes, um, the precise linkage between climate change and extreme weather, um, the, the precise nature of the role that clouds play um, and uh, whether they are 
an ameliorating effect or um, an aggravating effect uh, when it comes to uh, global warming. Um, I could probably list a dozen areas um, of genu genuine contention where scientists are publishing articles, making contrasting arguments in the peer-reviewed literature, and there are comments on those articles and replies, or at scientific meetings, the scientists are getting up and, and debating. Um, you know, uh, that's that's. And you're the, talking some very fine details they're arguing about, though. Well, that's right. So you know, it's in a sense uh, the science is sort of like a brick wall that has a few bricks missing. You know, enough bricks missing that there, there's a brick there for you. If you're a scientist, there, there, there's an area um, uh, where there's still important science to be done, where there's still genuine uncertainty. Um, and so the scientific community is sort of still finishing up that brick wall. There are bricks that are missing, but, but the wall exists, and it's very sturdy. Um, and that's sort of the corpus of scientific knowledge, what we know. Uh, we know that you know the greenhouse effect is real. We know we're increasing the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We know that's warming the planet. We know that's changing the climate. L there is no debate about any of those points um, in the legitimate scientific uh, community, in the scientific literature, at you know meetings uh, where scientists present their work. They're not debating any of those things. Um, what they're debating are the missing bricks, the things we're still trying to figure out. What is the impact? The Will there be more hurricanes in the Atlantic or fewer hurricanes? That's a genuinely contested uh, issue. Um, will the future climate look more like El Nino? Will we see a more El Nino-like world? Or the opposite, the flip side, the La Nina phenomenon, where the tropical Pacific is colder than normal. Um, and, and, and El Nino and La Nina have huge impacts on rainfall patterns out here in the western United States and, and winter temperatures, um, uh, patterns of weather around the world. So these are big, important uncertainties that scientists are trying to work out. Um, but that, and, and so there is vigorous debate. But it's about those sorts of details. It's not about whether global warming is real. And so there's this huge gulf between where the actual scientific debate is, which is about a lot of the details, and where some would like the public debate to be, where climate change is debated as if the, 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 the fundamentals are contested. Um, and that's simply not true. So, you know, on, there's, this, there's a huge gulf between where the legitimate scientific debate is and where the public debate, where our public discourse is on this issue. So there's no doubt, let me make a different analogy, there's no doubt that you have the big picture. Yep. We have the big picture, we're still painting, you know, filling in the details in that painting. But you, if you step back, you can make out the painting. You can make oh, out the scene. great. Good. Um, I, this, this next question is kind of personal, but do you find it frustrating? You know what you're talking about. We've established that. Do you find it frustrating to have to defend it? I mean, because how many times do you say, I, have the, I mean, I have the credentials, I've done all this research, blah, 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 blah. I mean, does my question make any sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, there's sort of, I, I guess I have... Well, let me, can I put it in more, in more perspective? So you're talking to me. I'm not a client sci climate scientist. Um, you've probably been on CNN, MSNBC, and they usually pit you against somebody, I'll bet. But not only that, you've testified in front of Congress. You've tried to explain this to people that basically are lay people. I, there's no insult to that. They have a job that they're good at. Yep. But basically, they're not scientists. And so you're trying to communicate and explain this to them. Right. Now go. Yeah. No, and, and, and sometimes, you know, there's a famous um, quote uh, from Upton Sinclair. It's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. Yes, okay. So I think sometimes when we talk about Congress, you know, it's actually an easier job to explain the science to five to ten year olds <laughs> because um, they listen. don't have, they'll <laughs> listen, they'll listen and they're open minded and they don't have an axe to grind in general. But some of these Congress people, they've got an axe to grind. Uh, they, they got their, you know, some of them because of the funding from fossil fuel interests and they see themselves as, as advocates for those interests. And so the real challenge is that um, when you're communicating, say, to, to, at, a, at a congressional hearing, is um, you're telling people something that they really don't want to hear and that they've got a motivated 
you know, reason to not want to accept. That is a real challenge, but at the same time, so I was going to say I have these sort of dueling emotions. Yes, it, you know, as you allude to, it can be frustrating to have to sort of explain these things over and over again and, and, and to continue, have to continue to defend the basic science when it's, you know. And justify that you know what you're talking about. And right, well, especially in an era where, you know, and that's been one of the discussions here at this uh, skeptics meeting, is we now live in an era where expertise is, is fundamentally, um, the, the knowledge that there are experts um, it, it, is being challenged. Um, and we live in the world of alternative facts now, where people feel entitled to their own facts, uh, even when they conflict with what the vast majority of scientists and say. And we're, we're not talking some sophisticated postmodernist philosophy here either. <laughs> no, we're saying. <laughs> Which is a different. Yeah, no, we're different just, alternative facts. No, absolutely. You know, we're talking, you know, climate, you know, climate, is climate change real? I mean, you know, it's the overwhelming consensus. The, U the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, every scientific society in the U.S. that's weighed in on this matter, um, you know, it is the consensus of the world's scientists. And yet, we witness the treatment of the topic, and you know, often in the media, um, this treatment as if it's a genuinely contested matter. And, and so that can be very frustrating. At the same time, if you're somebody who devotes uh, uh, your time and effort to communicating the science and its implications, there's a good chance you, you, you enjoy doing that. Um, okay. I, I, and I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't enjoy doing that. I, I enjoy trying to communicate the science and its implications to the public and to policymakers. And so that sort of counterbalances, yeah, there's some frustration, but there's sort of the, um, there's the adrenaline uh, of, of, of knowing that you're helping communicate science to the public. Um, and it, it, that's, it's an important thing to do. It's something that many of, many of us enjoy doing because we feel, we, we love doing science, and that's why I got into science, because I love working on problems. But I was sort of forced into the spotlight. I didn't choose to be in the public arena. I didn't choose to be engaged in the larger you know, societal debate about climate change and what to do about it. Uh, but because of my scientific work, I sort of found myself um, in the spotlight. Did this happen because maybe CNN called once and you were on and then it just blossomed? Can you explain that? How did you fall? Well, it was with the, the hockey stick graph oh, when we right, published that back in the late 1990s and that became sort of iconic in yeah, the climate yeah. change debate. And so I found myself at the center of the debate, I was being attacked by 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 some of these vested interests and their and their their advocates, who wanted to discredit the hockey stick, um, in in part but by that's discrediting data. me. Right, but it was it was inconvenient data to them because um, it, it did demonstrate in, in an easy, you know, in a very simple manner. You don't need to understand the complex workings of the physics of the climate system to understand what this curve was telling us, that there was this unprecedented warming that has taken place over the past century. So it, it did become an icon in the climate change debate. I suddenly found myself at the center of this contentious debate. It's not where I had, it's not what I had signed up for. You know, it's not what I thought I would be doing when I decided to double major in applied math and physics, um, you know, back in, and go off to study theoretical physics in graduate school. It's ultimately where I found myself. And over time, I, I learned to embrace that because it gave me, an, you know, I, what, like I said, it wasn't what I had signed up for. But to find yourself in a position to influence the larger discussion over what may be the greatest challenge that we face as a civilization, uh, the challenge to, yeah, to deal with climate change. To me, that's, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's uh, it, it's hard to imagine something, you know, a more rewarding um, opportunity than, than that. Uh, and so I have, I have embraced that, even though it's not what I signed up for, it's not what I thought I would be doing, uh, it's not really what I was trained to do, but over time it's what I've evolved into. It's interesting, um, now that you mention it in those terms, I'm wondering if you've ever had an incredible success story where somebody pulled you aside and just said, you know what, I went into this just angry and wasn't listening, and you, you, you convinced me, I don't know if I can sell this in my home state, it's going to be tough, but I've got to turn around. Because I have changed my mind sometimes and had to go back to somebody and say, wow, uh, you know, thanks, I didn't 
you know, have you, I don't know if someone would admit this publicly, but have you had people come to you and say? I have. I have, I have people who, who thank me for what I'm doing. Um, I get a lot of that. You know, I get people attacking me <laughs> because they're climate change deniers and, and, and they're convinced that I'm part of some global conspiracy. And, you know, and what, that's what is the conspiracy, though? <laughs> oh, that we, you know, to regulate carbon emissions oh, okay. so that we can take over the world, I guess. Um, it's never all that sort of clearly enunciated, okay. but... Uh, you know, that's, so there, you have the haters, and that's something you have to learn to deal with, um, but you also get a lot of positive feedback, and, and a lot of the positive feedback is from people who are on board, who, who accept the science and are happy that you're out there trying to, you know, communicate it, um, but once in a while, uh, you have this other very rewarding experience where you'll get somebody who was skeptical, legitimately skeptical about the science and, and they'll come to you after a public lecture that you've given um, and it says something about them. If they've come out to the lecture, right. they're probably okay. somewhat open-minded, you know, they're willing to be convinced. Um, there's some who aren't open-minded anymore. They're very difficult to reach because they're sort of, they've dug in their heels, they see this through an ideological prism um, and facts are unlikely to change their mind. They're, they're sort of it's motivated reasoning. Um, that's a real challenge, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about that here at this uh, skeptics conference because that is one of the great challenges we face: motivated reasoning. Um, when facts and figures aren't enough, because because it, it's almost become ingrained in somebody's ideology, their identity, and you're challenging their identity by telling them the climate change is real. Uh, but you will have folks who, who flip. You know, who, who are open-minded um, and they'll come to you uh, either after a lecture that you've given um, or, you know, you get an email, um, hey, you know, I saw you in this interview um, and, you know, I, I, I was, I, I had my doubts, but, but you've convinced me. Um, that is obviously rewarding for all the reasons you would think it's rewarding. It's it sort of, it's at least anecdotal evidence that, our efforts are having a real impact. Um, they are changing some people's minds. And there's some people whose minds won't be ch changed. Um, my sort of target uh, when I'm, you know, in my own outreach efforts and my own communication efforts is what I call the confused middle. Not the hardened sort of um, dismissives uh, who are almost, you know, ideologically driven to deny climate change, but the folks in between who are honestly confused. They, they, they perceive that there's this debate because uh, so often it's framed as if there is a debate and they've heard the talking points from the critics, from the contrarians, from the climate change deniers and, and it's confused them to the point that they don't know, you know what's right. They don't know who to listen to, who to believe. Um, in my view, that's sort of the sweet spot when it comes to our efforts to uh, communicate the science and its implications. This is sort of broad, confused middle. Um, you're not going to win over many of the dismissives, and you could spend a lot of time and effort trying to do so. Um, and that would be largely wasted effort that could have been spent, you know, targeted towards people who are persuadable. And when I asked that question, I was actually thinking, on a national scale, have you had a senator that was just dug in come oh. to you? But you don't have to answer that because you've answered it in a better way. Um, but there, there's that as well. There are some um, uh, politicians um, and sort of folks who uh, work in sort of the D.C. lobbying world. No kidding? Um, you've who turned have, the lobbyist have, around? There is, um, there's, uh, there's... Don't mention any names. No, I, I won't mention a name, but there's one uh, prominent, he was a prominent uh, climate change denier who worked for a right-wing think tank um, that has been very active in the effort to discredit climate science. And he had a moment sometime in the last couple of years. Um, and he now runs an organization uh, of conservatives um, who accept that climate change is real, and they want to have the worthy political debate about how to deal with it. That's so, what they think we should be debating. So as a lobbyist, though, he has to go back to all, he has to knock on all those doors again and say, hey, I looked at the science again. Well, he's probably per persona non grata in, in the circles that he used yeah, to be no, in. I, but, oh, yeah. even, the, even the people who talking. Okay. And what I meant by you answered it in a better way is that even if you've changed someone on the national scale, what I just heard from you was that when you're going for the middle, it's really up to me as a person to go to my senator and say, yeah, right. you know, stop, you know, this is a serious problem. I know there are a lot of other things. So you sitting in front of Congress and testifying, great, it's really up to 
their constituency to say, Absolutely. listen to that guy. And I think that I think it's easy to downplay the impact that people still have. That we, you know, it, it's what the populace thinks and wants still matters. Um, we feel that you know policy has become disconnected from the people um, because of gerrymandering and other challenges in our politics today. But w w something that we saw with, for example, the health care debate is that the will of the people still matters. When the people speak out, they speak with, with a, with a uh, loud voice collectively. That still has an impact on policy. And so for those of us who are working in this arena of climate change, uh, and sort of the debate over what, what to do about it. Um, I think that that can be a source of, of sort of cautious optimism that, that, we can, that we can get there here too, even despite all the challenges that we have today um, when it comes to climate and climate action. All righty, Dr. Michael Mann, I greatly appreciate this. Um, I it was had, a pleasure. Oh, thank you. I had uh, nine note cards of questions we didn't get past. Well, actually, three of the note cards were just your bio, and that's the short bio. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you can sum up. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Thank Brian you. Brian Kirby, 502 Conversations. One last question. I don't know if you can sum this up. There's been some talk about we're too late. No matter what, how do we mitigate? Where's the tipping point? Yeah. How do we figure that out? I don't know if you can... Yeah, it's never too late. Okay. Um, you, too often we, we, we frame or we allow the, the challenge to be framed as if it, it, there's a tipping point, there's a cliff that right. we walk off of. And, and, and some people say, well, haven't we already gone off the cliff? Um, that's not the right analogy. Uh, the analogy I prefer is a, a minefield. And we're walking out onto a minefield. And we've set off some, some of those explosives already. And, and there are more that we're likely to, to set off if we continue moving forward, um, the only solution is to get off of that minefield. Um, and so there's no one tipping point. Um, the more carbon we burn, the more we elevate greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more we warm the planet, the worse the impacts are going to become. Uh, another analogy I sometimes use, um, it's not a cliff. It's more like this downward sloping highway and it gets ever more treacherous as we go further down that highway. We want to get off the earliest exit that we can. All right, thank you. And we're here in Las Vegas where the lights are on 24 hours a day and I look <laughs> out. Well, there is this sort of um, almost uh, cacophony between talking about an issue uh, that is, you know, talking about environmental sustainability in a city that is so much, um, you know, uh, so much based on excess. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm Brian Kirby, 502 Conversations. My guest today has been Dr. Michael Mann. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It was my pleasure. You're welcome.